veintitantos y desde entonces pues se ha quedado allá. Y nos conocimos el año 90 en Alemania, porque he estado en varios países y ahora lleva ya pues como 20 años en la Universidad de Usano y se ha quedado aquí. Él trabaja en, sobre todo en barrera hematoencefálica y en neuroprotección y neuroregeneración. ¿no? Tiene libros de referencia sobre los cambios morfológicos, que son neuropatólogos experimental y luego hago el aunque no hace clínicos, es de medicina y aplicación. Y bueno, no, yo no sé, creo que la presentación es un poco larga, intentaremos aportarlo. Ya eh, está bien, me hace, pero eh, tiene cosas bien interesantes en los últimos tiempos sobre las nanopartículas y la neurotoxicidad, que es este, bueno, como se avisa la barrera que los cambios que se producen y uno de esos libros fundamentales hace ya dos años después de muchos trabajos es eh, la barrera como la puerta de entrada de enfermedades o sea la puerta de entrada por donde entran algunos tóxicos que se están en el fuera y que se almacenan al cerebro es esa especie de compuerta con el sistema general y responsable de algunas patologías del sistema nervioso central entonces sin más historias barrier and one half of the barrier was open. 
then they are studying also edema and they always compare the injured half versus uninjured half. I was not convinced. So we did some experiments there using immobilization stress, heat stress and also swimming exercise and we found that the blood brain barrier leakage is entirely different in different areas of the cortex. At that time this was very new. So then I understand that one can pinpoint by looking blood brain barrier the effect of a stress. It is not a non-specific response of a stress as Hanseli said in his book. And then at the end we compiled this book in 2003, Blood Spinal Cord Barrier and Brain in Health and Disease. The idea is that at that time still we have very less knowledge what is blood spinal cord barrier, is it different than blood brain barrier, it is different than blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier. So anyway, and I am very happy that my friend uh, we met at Humboldt Foundation in Berlin contributed good chapters here and that's why we are in collaboration for a long time. What we feel, what we feel that uh, these neurons, I mean they can work and in brain we have to protect our neurons but these neurons are in minority. We have much more in number glial cells and even more endothelial cells. So the point is that these endothelial cells and glial cells must be doing something to protect the neurons. And that was our theory. And as you can see here that the first example of anatomical sites for blood brain barrier was discovered by Brightman and Rees that lanthanum this is 20 angstrom in diameter was stopped here. So this, this was the first example of showing that this is the anatomical side of the barrier but at that time they forgot that this endothelial cell membrane is also the barrier and that we have discovered in Berlin together with Dr. Sarvas Navarov that these membranes they were also changed but the tight junctions may be intact. So that is our new finding on which we are working that not only tight junctions the cell membrane is the barrier and that is more important because some of the digestion proteins are found in non-neuronal cells like liver and other areas. This is Dr. Sarvas Navarov and you can recognize my wife and here is me. We were in Berlin as Humboldt Fellow working with uh, Dr. La at that time. And of course we have a couple of good papers with Dr. La Fuente. We first published paper together in 1990 in a brain edema. Then we reproduced these things in our laboratory in Uppsala, Sweden and we did the same thing. Uh, this is rat spinal cord and we injected lanthanum and we can see that lanthanum is not leaking and the neurons were very normal. After that we also focus on some other aspects that now we have the barrier between blood and brain. But what will happen between brain and blood? Do we have the same kind of barrier? For example, the blood brain barrier resides in this side and the brain blood barrier could be this side. Whether the cell membrane permeability is very similar to both sides, there are some researches that may be not same. But still we have a lot to do in this area because no new knowledge has come out regarding this. When we have injected Okay. When we have injected dyes or tracers in the brain, we can see that they are not coming into the blood. But under disease conditions, we can also see that this brain blood barrier is also increased under different aspects of stressful situations. So we have a hypothesis that any kind of CMS insert will open the barriers in the central nervous system causing larger molecules to come into the brain, for example proteins, and if these proteins or other immunological materials are entering into the brain through the environment, then we are going to have cellular changes or adverse reactions. Whether these are reversible or irreversible, I have not come across this idea yet. But the point is, they can produce edema, necrosis, ischemia, and also gene expression, apoptosis, all would lead to cell death. This is our hypothesis. Therefore, we want to block different areas uh, of uh, the action to have new action.
This idea that nanoparticles are very important in brain, they can have adverse effect because we are using nano drug delivery to have better effects. We must consider the neurotoxicological aspects of nanoparticles. This we have summarized in, in this book in 2010, I guess. And then we also associated with a new journal called Journal of Nano Neuroscience, which is published by American Scientific Publishers. And the faculty is very good. When we started work on nanoparticles, several governments got interested, and in this case, this is an Indian government, it was president at that time, wanted to develop a consortium with United States, Sweden, and other countries that we are so far successful. And not only that, some Nobel laureates like Andrew Shelley, who got Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1977, he also feels that the nanoparticles of nano delivery and its toxicological effects are very important nowadays that we must follow. And Dr. Shelley is also on the editorial board of one of our journals. This is Dr. Aaron Shikanova, he got Nobel Prize in 2004 in chemistry and he discovered ubiquity. We are in intensive discussion with him and also in collaboration about nano drug delivery and he feels that this could be one of the important ideas but he thinks that we should look at ubiquity expression after uh, nanoparticle intoxication. I have no time this time but maybe next time I will present those results. Basically I am a neuropathologist and I got training from Service Navarro in Berlin and after that I joined Professor Nick Olson from Uppsala University and I am still there. Then we try to show these new ideas with different kinds of publications. This is International Review of Neurobiology and telling that new concepts of um, uh, neural protection is necessary because we must understand the uh, blood and barrier because blood and barrier could be the uh, gateway of neurological disease. <coughs> and now the question come together working with USFDA. It is quite important to understand first the toxicological properties of nanoparticles because you know any drug <coughs> when we do in practice we must have this um, LD50 dose or its toxicology done first. But regarding nanoparticles, so far no data on neurotoxicology in vivo situations. There are lots of uh, works going on in cell culture but not in, in vivo situations. So we have undertaken this mission and this is our lab in um, one of the collaborators in my university, we are still collaborating. This is Dr. Patnayak, we are doing. And this is uh, Dr. Buddha uh, who visited us in collaboration. So this is still going on. Now I'll tell you some other things. Since we work with the uh, military uh, of the United States and also now uh, Chinese uh, military has joined us in our work. So we must understand that what are the problems of these military populations and most of them are staying Middle East for one reason or the other, they are exposed to silica dust. This is very common as you can see. So is it possible that a person exposed to silica dust get injured, traumatic brain injury or may have inherent disease like hypertension or diabetes, it could be exaggerated or the same treatment could not work for him. So this idea we are pursuing and in this situation you can see also this is uh, the military from Africa and they are all the time looking in this way. So this we consider as partial immobilization because they are very conscious and they are passing 8 to 10 hours a day like this. So the point is that whether stress, exposure to nanoparticles can affect their brain function. This is one of the important questions. And this is Dr. William Zinker, director of USFDA, where we work together with this because it's still a clear USFDA guidelines has not occurred regarding the use of nanoparticles and we are working on that. So the question is, how we can address this? We did some experimental uh, observations in our laboratory and I must tell you that human situations cannot be replicated in laboratory but we can still do some experiments. So the partial immobilization was done in this single instrument where the rats can uh, have good uh, air to come in and heat stress is given in this uh, instrument where we can maintain the temperature 
at 38 degrees Celsius and the wind velocity and humidity factors were kept constant. So first we measure high potential we have produced by 2 pp 1 clip means one uh, silver clip was done to construct a renal artery of 1 pp no kidney was removed and 4 to 6 uh, weeks later they develop high potential 180 millimeter mercury those going beyond 200 we have a score so you can see that here blood glucose level were not that much affected uh, normally 4 weeks 6 weeks when we have given immobilization stress at 21 degrees Celsius and also we have given at 33 the point is that well stress can be much more harmful if given at different ambient temperature cold could also be one factor but I am not discussing here then heat is very important so we can see some changes in, in glucose level when they were exposed to 33 high ambient temperature and this is mean arterial blood pressure. Mean arterial blood pressure in these high potential animals was highest when immobilization stress was combined at 21 degrees Celsius and 33 was slightly low and these are the control groups. Then we tested their uh, behavioral functions in a very simple way because we are not very neuropsychiatric laboratory. This is simple physiological laboratory. So we use this rotor rod, most of you know, and normal rats can stay here up to 120 seconds, no problem at 16 RPM manually. And this is the inclined plane you get for manually. Normally rats can stay for 30 seconds at 60 degree angle. But if they want then the angle should be low. And just to briefly mention you that these new works that we did with USFDA, they feel that we are doing very good work in this area. So look at this, silica exposure and rotor at performance. What is important point here is that when we have added immobilization stress at 33 degrees Celsius, they were, here is no silica, 21 and this hypertension, immobilization 33. And look at this, when we have added silica, they have the maximum worst performance. It means that silica exposure, hypertension, and stress at high ambient temperature all combine together, leading to worst behavioral changes. The same thing is happening also in inclined pain and You can see here, this is immobilization, silica, and hypertension. And immobilization, silica, uh, sorry, immobilization and hypertension only. These are two quite different things. So the point is that that silica exposure higher at 33 degrees Celsius, immobilization has further complicated. And I am showing you here the leakage of blood and barrier. And here is cortex, hippocampus, striatum, thalamus, hypothalamus, brainstem, and spinal cord T4. Because our brain is not homogeneous organ, each area or each uh, region has special effects. What you can see here, what you can see here that the combination of hypertension, silica, immobilization at 33 showing highest increase in radio iodine leakage in almost all areas of the The same thing is happening with brain edema, measure simply brain water content and the results are very similar. High potential, silica, immobilization at 33 is having the highest level of increase in brain water. In, they have done in different areas. Neural injury. Neural injury is also most severe and most marked in those areas in those groups where they are immobilized, silica exposed and 33 degrees Celsius. This is an example you can see here. This is hypertension, silica at 21. 
hypertension say that 33 and hypertension alone 33 and hypertension alone 21. So this group has more severe neuronal damage in cerebral cortex. Then we have given ketosis, only hyperthermia, 38 degrees Celsius, 4 hour. And here you can also see that in hypertension, hypertensive group, they are much more neuronal damage than the normal can see here. What could be the basic region here? Or what factors are involved? Well, there, there are lots of factors. But since we are studying in cytokines of different things, I am showing some example of T1 necrosis factor alpha. Some says that it has neuroprotective action. Some says that it could have other uh, neurodestructive actions. In other hand, it depends on the timing. If we have given pre-treatment, then this has more damage because probably the body needs this um, uh, things for good. But if we have 10 minutes or 30 minutes after blocking, it is good. But if we block after one hour, then it is not good. So this time is very important and that we have found here that TNF alpha antibodies nanowire given 30 minutes after heat stress in hypertensive group, we can have a still much more viable neurons as compared to this TNF alpha antibodies given without nanowire in 30 minutes after heat exposure. So this example shows that if we level the antibodies or drug by nanowire, we have better effect in same identical conditions. And one of the region what could be, we have major neural nitric oxides in case. And you can see that the best group we have when we have treated them, there is high upregulation of NMOFs here in normal density, but more in hypertensive group. And when we have given uh, TNF alpha uh, nanowire, it could reduce this nitric oxide in case expression. So the point is that that nanowire delivery, either topically or in production of anything, antibodies or drugs, have uh, better neuroprotective effects. Then, the most other important things is prevailing in our human society is diabetes after hypertension. In some of the groups, we have also both hypertension and diabetes. I'm showing you, due to lack of time, only some results from diabetes alone and their exposure to say. So here you can see this diabetes plus silica, this is leakage of albumin and you can see there massive leakage, silica and saline only and diabetes and saline, you can see. So here again we have proved that silica exposure to diabetic group opens the barrier much more adversely than other situations alone. And these are cellular structures. In the same areas, look, silica exposure in diabetic group, how the baculation and neuronal damage can be seen, whereas saline and silica and diabetes and saline. We have tested these light microscopic observations at the electron microscopy, especially looking for myelin vesiculation. And the results are very similar that we see here. Silica exposure in diabetes have maximum <coughs> myelin vesiculation and damage as compared to the other group. Then the question comes that if we use nanoparticle for adverse effect, whether size and age matters? The answer is yes. And I'm showing you some examples of our latest research. This was presented in 2011 in Society for Neuroscience, but results are still uh, important, so I'm showing you. So the question is whether age and size of nanoparticles matters. We have different kinds of uh, groups, 20, 30 nanometer, 50, 60, and 130 to 150. Age, we are also three different groups, and they were given chronically. I can tell you that the smaller the size of nanoparticles doing the greatest damage in the brain, and both young and older groups are more susceptible than so-called relatively young or middle-aged group. This is the finding we have seen. And of course our parameters are driven very breakdown, brain edema, neural injury, and here also nitric oxide expression. So here you can
can see here clearly that 20 to 30 nanometer is doing most damage on membrane barrier as compared to the larger size. And also this is universally once through leakage here is shown and the point is that 20 to 30 nanometer of every like silver, copper and aluminum. Then the question comes, can we differentiate different nanoparticles or size of nanoparticles of everything we have seen? No, here we are wrong. Silver has the most marked adverse effect and aluminum is the least. So if I had to order, uh, then silver followed by copper and aluminum and the size, 20-30 nanometer. So even the each nanoparticle have different effects, but the size has almost same effect. For, for example, aluminum, 20 to 30 nanometer is most dangerous. Silver, 20 to 30 more dangerous. But there is difference. Silver has higher uh, destructive capacity than aluminum. <coughs> And this is the same results of radio iodine. We see the same 20 30 nanometer silver followed by copper, and then here is the aluminum. Rainwater content also follows in the same lines. And volume swelling is just calculation from the rainwater, and it also shows that silver 20 30 nanometer has the highest damaging capacity in terms of rain. Nitric oxide synthase, we can <coughs> correlate that upregulation of nitric oxide synthase because it is a free radical, produces nitric oxide, can have damage. And here you can see again the results are very similar. Silver 20 to 30, copper 20 to 30, and even aluminium 20 to 30 has most expression of nitric oxide synthase. Distorted neurons are also following in the same way. And I am showing you some examples. There was a tight correlation with neuronal damage and leakage of barrier here with copper, aluminium, and silver. So we can say that neurotoxicity is inversely proportional, and young and elderly groups are more vulnerable. Then we did some. Here is the cellular structure I am showing and you can see here that young and old 50 to 60 nanometer and silver 50 to 60 nanometer and copper they are also damaging but the most marked damages are seen here in young and older groups. We went to electron microscopy here in Bilbao and this is uh, myelin basic protein, but look at this myelin damage. The young and older they are showing maximum damage to the myelin. So the neurotoxicity is size related and age influences toxicity. Now I am showing briefly in another 10 minutes therapy and another situation of a spinal cord injury, for example, because this is also quite common in uh, military personnel. Also, I can tell you that where this is very difficult to develop a model that is quite similar to clinical cases. But we are doing something in our laboratory. And we have some brain injury model, concussive head injury. It means this is dropped on the skull and then this has counter coup mechanism of injury. This is an open injury where the lesion is done on cerebral cortex. To treat, I can tell you that since injury or any kind of stress releases numerous chemicals in the brain. So it is very difficult to imagine that one drug that can modulate only one element could be good. So we came across this drug called cellulizin and this is the mixture of balanced composition of different kinds of neurotrophic factors, brain derived neurotrophic factor, glia derived neurotrophic factor, uh, NGF and also active peptide fragments in a balanced way and commercially available. So then, it is quite okay that 